When the human body is called upon for great effort, it's the heart that responds. The heart, center of life and power, perishing flesh and muscle through the bloodstream, making possible the movements we take so much for granted. By the same token, the hydraulic system of an airplane is the heart force that motivates the landing gear, the bomb bay doors, the wing flaps, and powerful brakes. Fifty grueling hours are in the books, and now a check of the hydraulic system is due. Crew Chief Duffy and his specialists, Chandler and Williams, are on the line ready for action. To start the check, Chandler heads for the bomb bay. There he opens the emergency hydraulic valve. This will permit the auxiliary pump to supply pressure throughout the system. Meanwhile, Williams connects a battery cart to supply power for the pump. But it's not quite time to turn it on. To run a retraction check, Duffy must first have the liberator raised on jack. The men are trained for this task. Six jacks raise 18 tons of precious airplane. It's a job that takes teamwork. Duffy now directs the synchronized lifting of the jacks. One, two, three, four, five, six. It takes a cross between a Toscanini and a Coxon to lead the men in raising both sides evenly. And it takes a well-drilled team to follow. 10, 11, 12, as the strut begins to extend. 45, 46. Soon as all wheels clear the ground, Duffy gets the signal. Hold it. All wheels clear. It's a fancy tail support, but in a pinch, you may have to use a little ingenuity. For pressure to raise the landing gear, Williams now turns on the auxiliary hydraulic pump. With pressure up, Duffy is ready to operate the landing gear selector valve control, which is safetyed by that little button on the top. Wait a minute, Duffy. Nose gear clear? Hoist away. Up she goes. The gears unlock, causing the green telltale light to go off. Chandler stands by to make sure that the nose wheel comes up first. By this and the operating pressure on the gauge, they know that the sequence valve is working. Now they check carefully as the main landing gear retracts. They watch the strut and fairings to make sure there are no bends or misalignments. Expert eyes watch each wheel enter its well. Next, they inspect the working of the up locks. Then the fit of the fairing is carefully tested. The fairing of the nose wheel is checked from outside. At the same time, Williams examines the nose wheel lock from within. After a signal that all locks are working, he lowers the wheels for the next check. Down they come. And they lock in place. The nose wheel follows in sequence. And the green light goes on again. After the auxiliary power switch is turned off, Duffy gets ready to raise the landing gear by means of the hand pump. First the landing gear control in up position. Then the pumping process. The nose wheel goes up first, as usual. Then the main gear. Now we know that in case of future heart failure, the flight crew will have an alternate way of raising the wheels. Next, Duffy puts the gear control in down position to check the emergency lowering of the gear. At the nose wheel, Chandler disconnects the lock linkage, which must be reconnected as soon as the wheel is down. It needs just a bit of persuasion before it will move. There it goes. In the bomb bay, the first few turns of the crank unlock the main gear. And 30 turns later, it'll be latched down. Duffy is well aware of the hazards of leaving his plane on the jacks any longer than necessary. Hey, don't pull that jack away until it's damn well clear of the pad. Duffy isn't taking a chance on a hand getting mashed or a hole being punched in the wing in case the oleo stick. Now for a check of the nose wheel clearances. 
this is where the strain of landing shows. There should be no clearance in the scissors. The thinnest feeler gauge shouldn't enter. And for proof that there's no binding, just think back to the perfect extension of the oleo when the airplane was jacked up. No clearance and no binding in the upper V strut. It's also checked for cracks, dents, and alignment. And while you're at it, better check the inner fittings. No clearance, no binding. And see that the feeler gauge doesn't enter the fitting of the rear drag link. Make sure the shimmy damper is in there securely. And the jam nut on the ram must be tight. We want no clearance or binding between the lower V and oleo struts. The same applies to the shimmy damper ram, top and bottom. They're behind that strut. In checking the lock linkage, Chandler looks for proper safety. Then make sure there is clearance between the latch plate and latch, and that it's correct, and again between the forward knuckle and the latch. Williams has it comparatively easy on the main landing gear, only he has two struts to inspect instead of one. First, he checks the condition of the scissors and makes sure there is neither clearance nor binding. Then he takes the clearance between the drag link and the wing fitting. And that's another inspection out of the way. Next, they get set to lubricate landing and nose wheel gear. To start, Chandler returns to the nose wheel well and approaches the scissors joint with his grease gun at ready. Then a salvo at the grease fitting. And he's sure to get them all, including the drag link fitting. And the fairing link of the nose wheel door. and the gearbox and the nose wheel latch mechanism on the main landing gear Williams greases the big scissors the landing gear latch and the upper drag link fitting they use oil of the correct specification on the nose wheel door emergency relief And make sure to wipe off all excess oil. On the main landing gear, oil the fairing hinge. And the fairing link. This completes the landing gear inspection. On to the wing flap check. Chandler begins by flipping on the switch to start the auxiliary hydraulic pump. At the signal, Duffy puts the selector valve to the down position. The flap starts down. Buffy notes that the operating pressure is not excessive. It would mean binding. And Williams checks the flap. Half down. And that's what the indicator registers. When the flaps are full down, the kick-out pressure automatically throws the flap control handle back to neutral. Buffy checks the relief valve by holding the control down until the higher pressure builds up. Then he moves the flaps up for the emergency check. Get the lead out, Chandler, and turn off the auxiliary pump switch. After unsafetying the emergency flap valves next to the co-pilot seat, 
Thus, he closes the forward valve and opens the one in the rear. Before he can pump the flaps down, he must set the flap control. Then he has to pump like hell for about 70 strokes. That's done it. Now that he's got him down, Duffy opens the front valve. Before he can raise the flaps again, he must wait for the shuttle valve to return to its normal position. With the flap all the way down, Williams knows that the pistons have bottom. He and Chandler check to see that the lower aft roller doesn't extend beyond the track. Be sure those tracks and rollers are clean, Sergeant. Check the cables for wear and tension. And coat them with rust preventive. Are the pulleys aligned? Good. Then the flat system is okay. The principles of the bomb door system are naturally the same as the flat. To start the inspection, Williams flips on the auxiliary pump switch in the bomb bay. Then going to the bombardier's compartment, he waits for a signal that everyone is clear of the bomb bay doors. And places the bomb door handle in closed position. As the doors start, Duffy checks the indicator light on the panel. It goes out as does the light on the tail, and Chandler makes sure the doors close completely. During that last operation, Duffy checked for normal pressure again, and at the instant the doors closed, he noted the kick-out pressure point. Next, Williams pushes the bomb door handle back to open position, and Chandler makes sure that the doors open properly. Williams holds the handle against the kick-out, so crew chief Duffy can check operation of the relief valve. Relief valve OK. Chandler inspects the condition of the track and doors in open position. He makes sure there is no dirt present, that the rollers operate freely, and that they aren't worn. The bomb doors can also be operated by using this hand crank with the bomb door selector valve in closed position. With the operational check complete, Chandler and Williams clean the bomb door tracks and rollers using rags soaked in cleaning fluid. They make the usual inspection of cables, cleanliness, lubrication, and wear, especially at the fair leads and pulleys. And to complete the bomb door inspection, they make sure the utility valve will operate the doors. Now that the shuttle valve has had time to return to normal, Buffy raises the flap. Then closes the rear emergency flap valve, leaving the front one open. And safeties them both in their normal operating position. Lastly, they close the emergency hydraulic valve. And safety. This pretty well winds up the operational check of the hydraulic system. Time for a conference. The boys remember that remark in the flight report. Airplane tends to pull to left when braking. Well, let's talk it over. We bled the brakes yesterday. Let's see if pressure is equalized between the outboard and inboard brakes. First step in the process is to disconnect the union and fittings. And keep that hydraulic fluid off the rubber tire. Williams brings on the equalizer test panel. And they connect it to the union fitting. Pressing the right brake pedal will give a reading on both gauges. Their diagnosis was correct. Look at that pressure difference. Hey, Duffy. Boost that inboard pressure about 75 pounds. Buffy, working just after the bombardier's compartment, loosens the lock nut. 
takes a couple of turns on the adjusting nut, and uses a valve depressor on the inboard brake valve, which allows them to take another reading on the gauge. One more turn and you've got her. See if that does it. Okay, Duffy, you hit it right on the nose. The lock nuts are tightened. And union fittings reconnected. Then back comes Williams to bleed the brake lines of air that got in during the equalizing. He removes the bleeder valve cap to get at the valve itself. A few turns are enough. Then Duffy depresses the brake valve long enough to wash all the air out of the line. Be sure to close the valve or the brakes won't work. And he taps it. Before checking the air pressure in the accumulators, Duffy turns off the electric motor switch and goes to the pilot's compartment. There he pumps the brake pedal to get rid of all hydraulic pressure. He keeps a close watch on the pressure gauges and carefully notes the point at which they drop off to approximately zero and stay there. That point indicates the air pressure in the accumulator. There she is. Back goes Duffy to turn on the auxiliary electric switch again. He's going to check the kickout point of the pressure switch. When the number three engine is run to complete the inspection, the same check will be made. They now start to work on the hydraulic system itself. Chandler goes over the lines for leaks, cracks, and kinks, and makes sure they're securely attached. They're set to check the fluid level in the reservoir. But first, bomb doors must be closed. We know that wing flaps are up and the landing gear down. Shy about a quart. As always, they use fluid of the proper specification. Up comes the fluid to the filler mark. Now Chandler gets ready to clean the QNO strainer. He first removes the entire assembly. Then takes the filter element out of the housing. And gives it a bath in unleaded gas. He rotates the unit so that all parts can be washed. Then blows out the gasoline with an air hose. Finally, he replaces the assembly and safety. The regular 50-hour inspection includes pulling all three wheels. In this case, a clevis is used to prevent the oleo from extending when the wing is jacked up. Only one wing jack is necessary for this operation. In order to get at the wheel retaining nut, Chandler takes off the wheel fairing. Then he removes the lock bolts, or cotter keys, from the nut. He disconnects the outboard brake line and protects the end of the fitting with tape. Now he's ready to unscrew the retaining nut. Out comes the brake assembly. Williams disconnects the links and raises the fairing clear of the tire. And Chandler screws on the thread protector to prevent damage when the wheel is pulled. A pretty large size gang is necessary to remove the wheel. Big bugger, isn't it? Then the bearings to be cleaned. 
candler puts it in unleaded gas to soak and goes back for the second one, which is taken out of the other side of the wheel. The axle is thoroughly clean. Then Williams closely inspects it for cracks. He goes over the brake assemblies for wear and general condition. But these expander tube brakes are never applied when the drum is removed or the tube will be ruined. Examining the tires is a necessary check. They absorb the first shock of each landing that this big liberator makes. Chandler washes the bearings and packs them with grease, working it in well. In with the bearings. On with the wheel. Time to remove the thread protector. Then replace the brake assembly and retaining nut. For their final step in the inspection, they make sure the brake clearances are within the limits. All the way around. Yes, she is alive, this B-24. Alive and kicking, and ready to go back into service with the men who trust her with their lives. Their lives and the life of that plane are right in the hands of the men who sit below and work and sweat by day and night to keep her flying.